Chapters 14 through 16 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 4, translated by Alexander Roberts and W. H. Rombo. Chapter 14. If God demands obedience from man, if he formed man, called him, and placed him under laws, it was merely for man's welfare, not that God stood in need of man, but that he graciously conferred upon man his favors in every possible manner. 1. In the beginning, therefore, did God form Adam, not as if he stood in need of man, but that he might have someone upon whom to confer his benefits. For not alone antecedently to Adam, but also before all creation, the Word glorified his Father, remaining in him, and was himself glorified by the Father, as he did himself declare, Father, glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Nor did he stand in need of our service when he ordered us to follow him, but he thus bestowed salvation upon ourselves. For to follow the Saviour is to be a partaker of salvation, and to follow light is to receive light. But those who are in light do not themselves illumine the light, but are illumined and revealed by it. They do certainly contribute nothing to it, but, receiving the benefit, they are illuminated by the light. Thus also service rendered to God does indeed profit God nothing, nor has God need of human obedience, but he grants to those who follow and serve him life and incorruption and eternal glory, bestowing benefit upon those who serve him, because they do serve him, and on his followers, because they do follow him, but does not receive any benefit from them, for he is rich, perfect, and in need of nothing. But for this reason does God demand service from men, in order that, since he is good and merciful, he may benefit those who continue in his service. For as much as God is in want of nothing, so much does man stand in need of fellowship with God. For this is the glory of man, to continue and remain permanently in God's service. Wherefore also did the Lord say to his disciples, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, indicating that they did not glorify him when they followed him, but that, in following the Son of God, they were glorified by him. And again, I will, that where I am, there they also may be, that they may behold my glory. Not vainly boasting because of this, but desiring that his disciples should share in his glory of whom Esaias also says, I will bring thy seed from the east, and will gather thee from the west, and I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, Keep not back. Bring my sons from far, and my daughters from the ends of the earth, all as many as have been called in my name, for in my glory I have prepared and formed and made him. Inasmuch, then, wheresoever the carcass is, there shall also the eagles be gathered together. Do we participate in the glory of the Lord, who has both formed us and prepared us for this, that, when we are with him, we may partake of his glory? 2. Thus it was, too, that God formed man at the first, because of his munificence, but chose the patriarchs for the sake of their salvation, and prepared a people beforehand, teaching the headstrong to follow God, and raised up prophets upon earth, accustoming man to bear his spirit within him, and to hold communion with God, he himself indeed, having need of nothing, but granting communion with himself to those who stood in need of it, and sketching out like an architect the plan of salvation to those that pleased him. And he did himself furnish guidance to those who beheld him not in Egypt, while to those who became unruly in the desert, he promulgated a law very suitable to their condition. Then, on the people who entered into the good land, he bestowed a noble inheritance, 
and he killed the fatted calf for those converted to the father, and presented them with the finest robe. Thus, in a variety of ways, he adjusted the human race to an agreement with salvation. On this account also does John declare in the Apocalypse, and his voice as the sound of many waters. For the Spirit of God is truly like many waters, since the Father is both rich and great. And the Word, passing through all those men, did liberally confer benefits upon his subjects, by drawing up in writing a law adapted and applicable to every class among them. 3. Thus, too, he imposed upon the Jewish people the construction of the tabernacle, the building of the temple, the election of the Levites, sacrifices also and oblations, legal monitions, and all the other services of the law. He does himself truly want none of these things, for he is always full of all good, and had in himself all the odor of kindness and every perfume of sweet-smelling savors, even before Moses existed. Moreover, he instructed the people who were prone to turn to idols, instructing them by repeated appeals to persevere and to serve God, calling them to the things of primary importance by means of those which were secondary, that is, to things that are real by means of those that are typical, and by things temporal to eternal, and by the carnal to the spiritual, and by the earthly to the heavenly, as was also said to Moses, Thou shalt make all things after the pattern of those things which thou sawest in the mount. For during forty days he was learning to keep in his memory the words of God, and the celestial patterns, and the spiritual images, and the types of things to come, as also Paul says, For they drank of the rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. And again, Having first mentioned what are contained in the law, he goes on to say, Now all these things happened to them in a figure, but they were written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages is come. For by means of types they learned to fear God, and to continue devoted to his service. Chapter 15 At first God deemed it sufficient to inscribe the natural law, or the Decalogue, upon the hearts of men, but afterwards he found it necessary to bridle, with the yoke of the Mosaic law, the desires of the Jews, who were abusing their liberty, and even to add some special commands, because of the hardness of their hearts. 1. The Jews had, therefore, a law, a course of discipline, and a prophecy of future things. For God, at the first, indeed, warning them by means of natural precepts, which from the beginning he had implanted in mankind, that is, by means of the Decalogue, which, if anyone does not observe, he has no salvation, did then demand nothing more of them. As Moses says in Deuteronomy, These are all the words which the Lord spake to the whole assembly of the sons of Israel on the mount, and he added no more, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone, and gave them to me. For this reason he did so, that they who are willing to follow him might keep these commandments. But when they turned themselves to make a calf, and had gone back in their minds to Egypt, desiring to be slaves instead of freemen, they were placed for the future in a state of servitude suited to their wish, a slavery which did not indeed cut them off from God, but subjected them to the yoke of bondage. As Ezekiel the prophet when stating the reasons for the giving of such a law, declares, And their eyes were after the desire of their heart, and I gave them statutes that were not good, and judgments in which they shall not live. Luke also has recorded that Stephen, who was the first elected into the diaconate by the apostles, and who was the first slain for the testimony of Christ, spoke regarding Moses as follows. This man did indeed receive the commandments of the living God to give to us, whom your fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for
for we do not know what has happened to this Moses, who led us from the land of Egypt. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifices to the idol, and were rejoicing in the works of their own hands. But God turned, and gave them up to worship the hosts of heaven, as it is written in the books of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me sacrifices and oblations for forty years in the wilderness? And ye took up the tabernacle of Molech, and the star of the god Remphan, figures which he made to worship them, pointing out plainly that the law, being such, was not given to them by another god, but that, adapted to their condition of servitude, it originated from the very same god as we worship. Wherefore also, he says to Moses in Exodus, I will send forth my angel before thee, for I will not go up with thee, because thou art a stiff-necked people. 2. And not only so, but the Lord also showed that certain precepts were enacted for them by Moses, on account of their hardness of heart, and because of their unwillingness to be obedient, when, on their saying to him, why then did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement, and to send away a wife? He said to them, Because of the hardness of your hearts he permitted these things to you, but from the beginning it was not so. Thus exculpating Moses as a faithful servant, but acknowledging one God, who from the beginning made male and female, and reproving them as hard-hearted and disobedient. And therefore, it was that they received from Moses this law of divorcement, adapted to their hard nature. But why say I these things concerning the Old Testament? For in the New also are the apostles found doing this very thing, on the ground which has been mentioned, Paul plainly declaring, But these things I say, not the Lord. And again, But this I speak by permission, not by commandment. And again, now, as concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give my judgment, as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. But further, in another place, he says, That Satan tempt you not for your incontinence. If, therefore, even in the New Testament, the apostles are found granting certain precepts in consideration of human infirmity, because of the incontinence of some, lest some persons, having grown obdurate, and despairing altogether of their salvation, should become apostates from God, it ought not to be wondered at, if also in the Old Testament the same God permitted similar indulgences for the benefit of his people, drawing them on by means of the ordinances already mentioned, so that they might obtain the gift of salvation through them, while they obeyed the Decalogue, and being restrained by him, should not revert to idolatry, nor apostatize from God, but learn to love him with the whole heart. And if certain people, because of the disobedient and ruined Israelites, do assert that the giver of the law was limited in power, they will find in our dispensation that many are called, but few chosen, and that there are those who inwardly are wolves, yet wear sheep's clothing in the eyes of the world and that God has always preserved freedom and the power of self-government in man, while at the same time he issued his own exhortations, in order that those who do not obey him should be righteously judged because they have not obeyed him, and that those who have obeyed and believed on him should be honored with immortality. Chapter 16 Perfect righteousness was conferred neither by circumcision nor by any other legal ceremonies. The Decalogue, however, was not cancelled by Christ, but is always in force. Men were never released from its commandments. 1. Moreover, we learn from the scripture itself that God gave circumcision, not as the completer of righteousness, but as a sign, that the race of Abraham might continue recognizable. For it declares, God said unto Abraham, Every male among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, as a token of the covenant between me and you. This same does Ezekiel the prophet say with regard to the Sabbaths. Also, 
I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And in Exodus, God says to Moses, And ye shall observe my Sabbaths, for it shall be a sign between me and you for your generations. These things then were given for a sign, but the signs were not unsymbolical, that is, neither unmeaning nor to no purpose, inasmuch as they were given by a wise artist. But the circumcision after the flesh typified that after the spirit. For we, says the apostle, have been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And the prophet declares, Circumcise the hardness of your heart. But the Sabbaths taught that we should continue day by day in God's service. For we have been counted, says the Apostle Paul, all the day long as sheep for the slaughter, that is, consecrated to God and ministering continually to our faith, and preserving in it, and abstaining from all avarice, and not acquiring or possessing treasures upon earth. Moreover, the Sabbath of God, that is, the kingdom, was, as it were, indicated by created things, in which kingdom the man who shall have persevered in serving God shall, in a state of rest, partake of God's table. 2. And that man was not justified by these things, but that they were given as a sign to the people, this fact shows, that Abraham himself, without circumcision and without observance of Sabbaths, believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Then again Lot, without circumcision, was brought out from Sodom, receiving salvation from God. So also did Noah, pleasing God, although he was uncircumcised, receive the dimensions of the ark, of the world of the second race of men. Enoch, too, pleasing God without circumcision, discharged the office of God's legate to the angels, although he was a man, and was translated, and is preserved until now as a witness of the just judgment of God, because the angels, when they had transgressed, fell to the earth for judgment. But the man who pleased God was translated for salvation. Moreover, all the rest of the multitude of those righteous men who lived before Abraham, and of those patriarchs who preceded Moses, were justified independently of the things above mentioned, and without the law of Moses. As also Moses himself says to the people in Deuteronomy, The Lord thy God formed a covenant in Horeb. The Lord formed not this covenant with your fathers, but for you. 3. Why then did the Lord not form the covenant for the fathers? Because the law was not established for righteous men. But the righteous fathers had the meaning of the Decalogue written in their hearts and souls. That is, they loved the God who made them, and did no injury to their neighbor. There was therefore no occasion that they should be cautioned by prohibitory mandates, because they had the righteousness of the law in themselves. But when this righteousness and love to God had passed into oblivion, and became extinct in Egypt, God did necessarily, because of his great good will to men, reveal himself by a voice, and led the people with power out of Egypt, in order that man might again become the disciple and follower of God. And he afflicted those who were disobedient, that they should not condemn their Creator. And he fed them with manna, that they might receive food for their souls. As also Moses says in Deuteronomy, And feed thee with manna, which thy fathers did not know, that thou mightest know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word of God proceeding out of his mouth doth man live. And it enjoined love to God, and taught just dealing towards our neighbor, that we should neither be unjust nor unworthy of God, who prepares man for his friendship through the medium of the Decalogue, and likewise for agreement with his neighbor, matters which did certainly profit man himself, God, however, standing in no need of anything from man. 4. 
And therefore does the scripture say, These words the Lord spake to all the assembly of the children of Israel in the mount, and he added no more. For, as I have already observed, he stood in need of nothing from them. And again Moses says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? Now these things did indeed make man glorious, by supplying what was wanting to him, namely, the friendship of God. But they profited God nothing, for God did not at all stand in need of man's love. For the glory of God was wanting to man, which he could obtain in no other way than by serving God. And therefore Moses says to them again, Choose life, that thou mayest live, and thy seed, to love the Lord thy God, to hear his voice, to cling unto him. For this is thy life, and the length of thy days. Preparing man for this life, the Lord himself did speak in his own person to all alike the words of the Decalogue, and therefore, in like manner, do they remain permanently with us, receiving, by means of his advent in the flesh, extension and increase, but not abrogation. 5. The laws of bondage, however, were one by one promulgated to the people by Moses, suited for their instruction or for their punishment, as Moses himself declared. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments. These things, therefore, which were given for bondage and for a sign to them, he cancelled by the new covenant of liberty. But he has increased and widened those laws which are natural and noble and common to all, granting to men largely and without grudging, by means of adoption, to know God the Father, and to love him with the whole heart, and to follow his word unswervingly, while they abstain not only from evil deeds, but even from the desire after them. But he has also increased the feelings of reverence. For sons should have more veneration than slaves, and greater love for their father. And therefore the Lord says, As to every idle word that men have spoken, they shall render an account for it in the day of judgment. And, He who has looked upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And, He that is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. All this is declared, that we may know that we shall give account to God, not of deeds only, as slaves, but even of words and thoughts, as those who have truly received the power of liberty, in which condition a man is more severely tested, whether he will reverence and fear and love the Lord. But for this reason, Peter says, that we have not liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as a means of testing and evidencing faith. End of Book 4, Chapters 14 through 16